This talk is on communication efficient asynchronous multiparty computation with adaptive security. My name is Martin Hirt and this is joint work with Anik Schopar and Jenda Liu Zhang. First, very briefly, what is MPC? We consider N parties, T of them are corrupted. The parties are connected with bilateral channels. And the goal of MPC is to evaluate the circuit where each input is given by one of the parties and the output is revealed to entitled parties. In the literature, one considers several models with respect to the network. One distinguishes synchronous channels and asynchronous channels. In synchronous channels, the delay of, of the channels is bound by a non-constant, whereas in asynchronous channels, messages can be delayed arbitrarily. Messages can even overtake each other. The adversary can control the delay of messages. With respect to corruptions, one distinguishes static corruption and adaptive corruption. Static corruption means that all parties are corrupted right at the beginning of the protocol, whereas in adaptive corruption, the adverse is allowed to corrupt parties during the protocol execution, and he chooses the parties to corrupt depending on information gathered so far. With respect to security, one distinguishes computational security and information theoretic security, where computational security usually is based on some hardness assumption and the adversary is assumed to be polynomially bounded, whereas in information security, in, in information theoretic security, the security is unbounded without assumption. In this work, we consider the asynchronous network model and we allow the adversary to adaptively corrupt parties and we are after computational security. In this model, the best possible corruption threshold is T smaller than over 3. A little bit of history. Asynchronous protocols with T smaller than over 3 were first introduced by Benor, Kelmer, and Rabin. They achieved adaptive security at some uh, communication complexity, which was very high. Later on, myself, Nielsen, and Schuttertek presented the statically secure asynchronous MPC protocol that communicated n to the 3 uh, per, per multiplication gate and we improved this later uh, to n squared. Patra, Hudari and Rangan presented an adaptively secure MPC protocol that communicates n to the 5 and Hudari and Patra presented a statically secure MPC protocol in the asynchronous model that assumes somewhat homomorphic encryption and communicates only linear per multiplication gate. This was further improved by Cohen by assuming uh, fully homomorphic encryption where the overall communication complexity does not depend on the circuit size. Furthermore, Hudhari presented an adaptively secure asynchronous MPC protocol that communicates O of n to the 4 per multiplication gate. As said, in this work we focus on adaptive security and what we achieve is adaptive security against a cryptographic adversary. We achieve standalone security and we do not assume somewhat or fully homomorphic encryption. We, we have two protocols in the paper. The first protocol tolerates t smaller than over 3 which is optimal in that model and communicates O of n squared per multiplication gate. Note that this is the same communication complexity as is needed for static security if you don't want to assume somewhat homomorphic encryption, respectively fully homomorphic encryption. Our second protocol tolerates slightly less corruptions and it has linear communication complexity and it assumes secure erasures, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs and atomic send. Atomic send means that if a non, that a party send, can send a message to all other parties, where if the party is honest, then it, the message arrives at all other parties. If the party is malicious, then the adversary chooses what happens, but the adversary cannot corrupt the party during the send operation. We follow the CBN approach, which means that we assume a homomorphic threshold encryption scheme and we assume that the secret key of that scheme is initially shared among the parties. Then in order to provide an input to the computation, the party would encrypt the input and um, send the encryption to everybody and prove plain text knowledge. 
addition, of course, is for free by exploiting the homomorphism of the encryption scheme, and for multiplication, we will employ some subprotocol. In order to output, um, we use threshold decryption towards the entitled parties. So first, each party encrypts his input, proves plain text knowledge, and then we go through the circuit, additions for free multiplications with the protocol. Finally, we have an encryption of the output, which is then threshold decrypted towards the entitled parties. We employ circuit randomization by Beaver, which means that in, a, in some preparation phase, which is independent from the concrete circuit, the parties prepare a bunch of triples A, B, C. A triple A, B, C are three encryptions where the plain text of the first two encryptions multiply to the third encryption. And then, of course, in the computation phase, we can use these triples. We, for addition, we just use the homomorphism of the encryption scheme. And for multiplication, in order to multiply two values to encryptions X and Y, the parties pick the next triple A, B, C, and then they decrypt X minus A and Y minus B. And one can see that the product X times Y can be written as a linear combination of the ciphertext A, B, C, which can be computed non-interactively. So this means that multiplication boils down uh, to two public reconstructions. Now, how do we prepare these triples? So first of all, the parties generate the random A. Therefore, each party PJ chooses a random AJ, encrypts it, and broadcasts asynchronously. That means A costs big AJ. Furthermore, the party starts bilateral proofs interactively to prove by text knowledge of AJ. Then the party run an agreement on a core set uh, protocol in order to find at least n minus uh, t parties who did the first step correctly. That is, each party votes for a party to be in the core set if the party received the ACAS from that other party and also accepted the proof of plain text knowledge. Then all the parties compute A as the sum of the AJs from the parties in the core set. Then the parties produce the B and the C simultaneously. For the B, the parties just follow the same approach as for the A. And for the C, as now the A is known already, each party provides a CJ, which is the BJ times A plus some randomization. So the CJ will contain a plain text, which is the product of the plain text of A and the plain text of BJ. Again, the parties uh, start bilateral proofs of plain text knowledge of BJ and multiplication proofs of CJ. Then the parties run again a core set agreement protocol to find a subset of at least n minus t parties who did step four correctly. And then they compute B as the sum of the BJs in the core set and C as the sum of the CJs in the core set. One can easily verify that this triple ABC is now a correct multiplication triple and that the adversary does not know the plain text of A or B and of course not of C neither. About the communication complexity, the first step uh, requires O of N A cast operations. Then in the second step, we have one ACS steps four and five equivalently. And now by running this pr protocol multiple times in parallel, we can amortize the costs of ACS and of A cost. So we have two ACSs overall and the cost of A cost if the message, so if we, if we, if we want to A cost multiple messages at the same time, then we can amortize the cost of A cost and we can have linear cost, which sums up overall then to cost n squares n squared times kappa. Now we want to achieve linear communication complexity. First thing we do is we replace the bilateral proofs by non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, which means that each party will just A cast one big message. Furthermore, we assume that in the setup, two committees are given, two sets C1, C2, random subsets of the party sets, where the size of each committee is approximately k. 
each party knows if it is in a committee, but parties not in a committee do not know who is in the committee. And now instead of having each party provide a random HA, we have only parties in the first committee provide a random HA, and then the sum of the HA still is A and will be known to everybody, but only the parties in CI provide an HA. We do exactly the same thing for the BJCJ pair here, just to use a different committee. And here we use the fact that the parties just need to send one message and they use atomic send in order to do that. This means that if, in, if a party is, is uh, honest, if a party in the committee is honest, then it will actually broadcast a, a valid message with correct non-interactive serial knowledge proofs in it. So this brings down the communication complexity. Instead of n a costs, we have now kappa a costs and the costs for an a cost by using a recent paper by Blumenthal, we have costs of uh, poly and kappa times n, which then sums up to overall com communication complexity O of n times poly of kappa, which by just standard techniques can be shown to, uh, to be equivalent to O of n times kappa. Now in the computation phase, as said before, for input, the party would just encrypt x, a cost x and proof by text knowledge, addition, exploit the homomorphism, multiplication, we consume one triple and we need two public reconstructions. And then for the output, we just reconstruct right to entitled parties. Now for these public reconstructions, we use the technique by Damgard Nielsen of uh, 07, namely we reconstruct n minus t, n minus 2t encryptions at the same time in parallel, and therefore we first expand these n minus 2t encryptions with, with a linear error correction code to n encryptions, and now each encryption is reconstructed towards one party, and the party will, will then send the plain text yj to everybody. And everybody then receives a whole bunch of such yj's, applies error correction, and can reconstruct the values x1 up to xn minus 2t. The communication complexity of this protocol is n squared, but as we reconstruct O of n ciphertext at once, this amortizes to O of n per multiplication. Now, is this adaptively secure? Well, of course it's not. If an honest party provides some input, this means that it uh, a costs an encryption of the input. Now in the, in the simulation, the simulator does not know that input if the party is honest and the simulator would just present a random encryption to the adversary. But later the adversary could corrupt that party and this, then the simulator needs to explain how this encryption contains the value, the input value of that party. And of course, the simulator cannot. So this is not adaptively secure. In order to achieve adaptive security, we use the, this trick by Dungard Nielsen 03. The basic idea is that a setup assumption, we assume to have a, a constant encryption of one, we call this K. And then in order to encrypt the message M with respect to this K, we just multiply K N times and we add an encryption of zero in order to randomize. So clearly uh, this gives an encryption of M if K is an encryption of one. However, in the simulation, we will in the setup, assume that k is not an encryption of one, but k is an encryption of zero. So thereby in the simulation, all values are zero. The inputs are encryptions of zero, outputs, everything is encryptions of zeros. So this is pretty easy to simulate, right? However, one problem we have now, of course, is that in the simulation, the output y will always contain zero. And this is not uh, uh, the same as in the real world. So what we do here is we will not reconstruct the output y, but we will reconstruct the value y plus m, where m is constructed in such a way that in the real world, m is an encryption of zero. And in the ideal world, m can be chosen by the simulator. 
The basic idea here is to assume an additional value r to be part of the setup, where r in the real world, r is an encryption of zero, and in the simulation, r is an encryption of one. And then the parties will encrypt some m with respect to r, where this m is somehow, I will not explain here how, chosen by the simulator. Now clearly e r of m in the real world contains zero, because r is an encryption of zero, so in the real world this does not change the output. Whereas in the ideal world, the simulator can choose and uh, his contributions and j in such a way that m will contain the plain text he wants and thereby can open the, the output value of the computation as desired. Now there is a second problem. If all encryptions contain a zero, then of course the inputs given by the adversaries cannot be uh, extracted. So the simulator cannot find the inputs that the adversary gives into the computation in the real world, and so he cannot give these inputs to the functionality. But this can easily be solved by just adding a UC commitment to the input stage. So if a party wants to give an input, not only he needs to provide an encryption with respect to K of that input, but in addition, the party also needs to UC commit to that input and proof in zero knowledge that the commitment contains the same value as the encryption. Let me conclude. We have presented two protocols. The first protocol is for the asynchronous network. It achieves adaptive security and it communicates n squared per multiplication. This is as efficient as the best known protocol not using SAG or FAG, but our protocol is adaptively secure. Then we have presented the second protocol, still asynchronous network, adaptive security, and with linear communication complexity. Here we have to pay a price on the corruption threshold, so T is slightly smaller than N over 3. We need to assume erasures, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, and atomic send. It's an open question to achieve adaptive security with linear communication complexity in the standard model.